I've been doing this a long time. My name is Dave Grantham, and uh, thank you, Reza, for inviting me to come and present on this very poignant and apropos topic. Um, no, I was expecting a larger crowd, but um, how many of you guys saw the news article last week of Scarlett Johansson deciding that OpenAI had ripped off her intellectual property, her name, image, and likeness? Okay, that's what this talk is going to be about, um, in part. So, what I'm going to try to cover is why my entire career uh, turned out to be something entirely different than I thought it was going to be, and it was always about answering this question: How do you prove it? Right. The thing about security is, how do you know your software is secure? How do you know your data came from where it says it came from? How do you know your data hasn't been changed? And more importantly, how do you prove it? And this is not an easy problem to answer by any means. Um, we typically lean on cryptography these days because it's the easiest way to do it, and it's the most effective way to do it, actually. But there are lots of other ways. We used to have human processes around this, you know, like multiple people reviewing transactions, approving transactions, um, reviewing data and stuff. In fact, we just came from a keynote where the speaker was talking a lot about how they were um, trying to verify the interfacing between organizations. Um, this can be automated if you know how to use cryptography correctly. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, about me, uh, I've been in this. I was just telling Reza, this actually is a shocking number for me. I was just doing some math. I, I can't believe I've been doing this for 30 years. Um, I put this up here just kind of, I was laughing this morning when I put this in here because I just recently realized that I thought I was a software engineer. I thought I have always been a software engineer. Turns out I've actually been a data security engineer for life and actually what we prefer to call that now is a data provenance engineer, someone who knows how to build systems that not only verifies where data came from, but that it hasn't been modified, um, that it's been stored securely, um, that we have the rights to possess it, that we have the rights to do with that data what we, um, ha or, or what we are doing, right? And so <laughs> I've always said I was just like a software security engineer. Um, but it's actually this. This is the hard reality. I, I've spent a lot of time in startups, many projects. Some of these I think you guys recognize. Um, I helped rebuild what's called the, data, the onboard data acquisition and monitoring system for the Boeing 787 test program back in the early 2000s. Um, this was a really fun project, totally not what I thought I would be doing in my life. But I was a video game programmer prior to that. And I had a friend who worked at Boeing. And they were like, you know what? We're building a plastic airplane, so we had to go with plastic wires. So they put, uh, they can't put copper in the wings of a plastic airplane because they become lightning hazards. So they put fiber optics, and so all their data rates went up by a factor of 10. Well, when engineers get more data, they do more things. And um, the software I rewrote for this project, uh, the first commit in the repo was older than I was. And it was designed for an 8-bit uh, embedded, wasn't even a general processing controller, it was, for, it was firmware for an embedded data processor. We rewrote the whole thing in parallel, but more importantly, we added cryptography to do end-to-end -end attestation uh, from the hardware that was gathering, from the, the, the strain gauges and the flow rate meters and all the stuff in the aircraft, all the way through archive, all the way through analysis, all the way to the compliance uh, reports on the desks of the FAA inspectors. So we could, and I'll get to this in a second. So also um, spend time in video games. Uh, this one was a very formative experience for me. It was the very first uh, uh, metaverse application, and it was the very first digital economy. People could make things, sell things to other users. We had the very first digital currency, the Linden dollar. In fact, when I was working on this project, Bitcoin was introduced. And the reason I'm standing on this stage today is because I was working on the only digital currency in the world, which was centralized. And of course, we all knew that decentralized Bitcoin would never work. And so all my friends are rich, but not me. Because um, uh, I told them, I was like, holy crap, I was really into digital currencies. So I texted a bunch of friends. And in fact, they're very famous uh, Bitcoin people in Austin now. Um, I, I, I famously sent them a text saying, holy crap, Bitcoin's broke a dollar. We should probably buy some. 
they all did. I did not. I have a lot of Linden dollars, though. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I spent some time in the trenches fighting um, bad governments in the world, um, then also trying to protect users from bad corporations in the world, then trying to figure out how we take what we learned from Bitcoin and put it into the government. And then, um, holy crap, maybe C++ is the bug. Let's invent a new language that uh, actually solves the problems. I, I was part of the team that evaluated Rust as, a, as an option for reducing the number of bugs, security bugs going into Firefox. And uh, we tried for years to make C++ programmers better at writing C++, and it, did, it didn't do anything. We made smart pointer libraries. We trained them. We had conferences on how to do it right, all this stuff. And it didn't make any difference. So then we rewrote. We wrote, well, we created Rust, and I, I wasn't on the original team that built Rust, but I was the security team that was like, hey, maybe if your goal is to improve security in software, let's see if it works on our main software, which is Firefox. So we rewrote the URL parser in Firefox in Rust. That was the very first thing to be rewritten in, in Rust in Firefox. And uh, the URL parser was how hackers made a healthy living for probably four or five years at Pwn to Own being able to hack Firefox. So we were regularly seeing bugs, security vulnerabilities there. And um, when we rewrote it in Rust, it went to zero. Yeah. What? Keep moving. Am I boring you? I love that I did all this stuff. I'm sorry, I could talk about it forever. Um, and, oh, and actually, the, uh, and one last thing here. I don't remember, whatever. Doesn't matter. Um, the realization that I'm actually a data security engineer came from this. My entire career has been spent an, uh, answering these questions. Not designing systems, not solving technical problems, but actually being able to, do, to answer these questions. Prove that this analysis was done on unmod unmodified flight test data. It has to have come from the strain gauge in the aircraft all the way to the report without modification. Um, Prove this data came from a web server that we're talking to, or prove this data created your game by your game studio, and we can publish it, right? Or you know, prove contributions. This is the one I've been working on for the last ten years when I was at the Linux Foundation. Um, prove contributions to this open source project are bound by the contributor agreement, and therefore we can sell this to the government, or the government can use it. it more, more importantly, or corporations and stuff. And then my favorite one: prove that this that you created this digital hair <laughs> for Second Life, and and. If the user doesn't have the rights to sell it. So anyway, um, I'm going to keep moving here. I could nerd out on this all, the day, all day long. Why is this not working? Sure about Rust, though. Oh, yeah? I, I'm a huge Rust programmer. We have server pass, but I haven't gotten into Rust yet. Now I'm thinking I'll have to. Rust is definitely worth it. OK, I, w I wanted to point out, uh, I saw this on LinkedIn this morning. Is Steve Wilson here? Perchance, I was going to pick on him. He's supposed to be here at the conference. Um, he posted a bunch of stuff in response to, a, to Apple's AI announcements at, um, at their developer conference. And um, these are all great, but I wanted to highlight just this one. Um, Steve's a smart guy. It all comes down to using data provenance and integrity checks, especially around AI. Like, where did your training data come from? Like, so the reason I spent all that time talking about security and software and systems and stuff um, is because what the point of my talk is, is this data provenance here. So as I said in the previous slide, right, this is what I was asked to do. These are all data provenance problems. The keynote we just came from where they were talking about, hey, we're going to put all this data in a big data lake. Um, I was going to ask him a hard question, which was, how do you know the data that goes into your data lake came from where you thought it came from, that it hasn't been modified, it's reliable data that you can make operational decisions on? Um, he didn't address that at all, and I didn't want to make it go too long, so I didn't ask. But that is a relevant question for something like that, right? Um, you do this giant data lake. You're getting it from hundreds of sources. Uh, if someone said, prove to us, one of these questions, prove to us that this organization is spending money correctly based off of the data that we have, can you prove that that data is correct data, or at least comes from where we think correct data comes from and hasn't been modified? So anyway, I just want to point out this is really great. We're starting to see that, um, that training data, iterative AI models, prompts, and outputs all need to be linked together so that you know in this new world with the Scarlett Johansson um, uh, lawsuit 
that you can prove that it wasn't trained on her data and that any similarities to her is actually a result of the aggregation of all the training data that you've already put in there. It's kind of like those disclaimers in movies, right? Like any resemblance to people real or imagined is, is an unintentional, so don't sue us. Um, this is going to be a very interesting thing in, in the, the very near future with AI is being able to say our model was trained on data that we had the rights to train on. And therefore, anything that comes out of it, we also have the rights to. And you can sue us because it's similar to you or to something you own, but you don't really have any claims or we can argue um, uh, with strong evidence that, that their claims are, are without merit because it, we didn't steal from you and we can prove it. Again, we can prove it. That's the important part. So anyway, I'm going to cover this real quickly, or real quick. Um, provenance. Does anybody know what I mean when I say provenance? You guys all nodding your heads. Okay, so provenance. In fact, I'll just I'll go through this really quickly. So uh, provenance is just sort of the it, it's it's a time history of unbroken uh, chain of custody on a piece of data or an artifact or anything like that. It tells you who owns it, uh, how did it transfer from one owner to another. Um, has it been modified in any way, that kind of stuff. The, the classic example that we always give is that the Mona Lisa, if you go to the Louvre in France, you can go inside and you can see the priceless original Mona Lisa. You can also walk outside and you can buy a Mona Lisa that is so perfectly a replication of the original that it's difficult to tell the difference between them. But the one outside is only $200. And the one inside is priceless. And the only difference between those two things is that the one inside comes with it a stack of parchment of letters handwritten all the way back to the brush of Leonardo da Vinci. So they can prove that he painted it. And then, you know, because he was a patron of some person in Italy, and then it became theirs. And then they sold it to the church. And then the church sold it to a gallery. And then the gallery, you know, they can document the exact origin of that painting all the way back to Leonardo da Vinci, and that's why it's priceless. But the one outside, which is effectively identical, is worth about 200 bucks. Um, so that's the difference. Provenance is actually the source of value in all data. And our world is about to flip where that is true for literally everything, I think, because we now have platforms online that accept any data. You know, Facebook, whatever. You can upload pretty much anything, any image, any text, whatever. And then they are trying to retroactively go back and remove anything that they don't want on their platforms. It causes all kinds of problems. But so this is that's a there's a retroactive blocking mechanism. But when you build a system that's fully decentralized, that can prove provenance of data, you can now build systems that say we only accept data that has provable provenance. And in that world, having provenance is where all the value is. So you could, if you were Sony and you're making the latest summer blockbuster movie, you literally could just put it on the internet. Anybody can download it. But nothing would ever play it unless you had provable provenance with it, that you actually have a legitimate copy that you paid for. And we use encryption to do all of that stuff, and you can't fake it. So. Um, success criteria for a decentralized provenance system. Let's just go over those real quick. Um, this is something I've been working on for 20 years. A lot of research and development went into this in the last five uh, in the formation of Cryptid. And our, we're launching our first use case here in just a couple of weeks. So um, the success criteria, you want to use, uh, have a smart use of cryptography, which is, and I, I say smart because just throwing digital signatures and things at problems doesn't, doesn't solve it. Um, in this case, we really only care about data integrity, and, and we use the data integrity mechanism to make sure that you can prove that, hey, you know, I may claim that I'm Dave, but you don't have to trust it, because I've also added in a way for you to go to outside KYC vendors and get multiple proofs from them in real time that what I'm claiming here in the provenance record is actually true. Okay, and the data integrity piece means that those URLs haven't been modified. You can convince yourself that they're not, that they're exactly as I intended. And then you can also convince yourself 
through the certificate authority system that Equifax is actually Equifax or the Bank of America is actually Bank of America. So data integrity is how you glue this all together. Quickly, I remember in PlayStation 2 that we were able to duplicate the games and then we could forge the actual provenance key that was at the front of the PlayStation 2 by using the boot disk to be able to smuggle through and then we'd open the disk mid thing and then yep. tap in our, our recorded disk and then we could boot off of it because it didn't have the provenance at the beginning or the certificates at the beginning. Can you talk on this a little bit because what's going to change that from the future or from China from releasing chips that will be all? <laughs> Right, so um, this is always going to be a problem with enforcement, right? This is true today, this is, will always be true. Um, in, the world's, in, in a world where, um, in the West I should say, we have a legal framework for dealing, for dealing with enforcement. I don't believe that DRM has ever been an effective in, uh, enforcement mechanism, like hey, it's encrypted until uh, we decrypt it for you because you can always tap in downstream of the decryption and that's exactly what you're talking about. Um, I'm not saying that this solves all the problems. What I'm saying is that we are allowed, we are now able to build, a sis, build systems that um, at least can defend their actions uh, using cryptography that is legally admissible in court. So if you build an AI that trains on data, you can prove that the data that you trained on, you had legal rights to do so on that, and therefore all the downstream effects. So if you're talking about like protecting video games, that's actually a really interesting use case, because I'll get to that here in a little bit. Um, the problem is, is that the disks themselves are streams of data that are baked in a circle on a piece of plastic. Okay? And streams that are only authenticated at the beginning are susceptible to this like downstream swap effect. And so if you want to continue to protect this, you, you have to have a, a continuous reauthorization of, of provenance is really what it is. So this could have been solved if as you're reading the, the disk, right, there were periodic checks. And so it would only take one actually because you would put the thing in and then you pop it open and you swap it and you put the other one in, but then halfway through the game, you don't know where it is, where it's going to say, by the way, you need to revalidate. And because that can be somewhat random during your gameplay, you wouldn't know when to swap back and then swap back, and it would only take one, and it would totally keep you from finishing the game. But it would be a reauthorization at some random point in the future of the stream that would thwart your efforts. So you'd only be able to play a little bit, right? Entertainment is just free. I was involved with MPEG and JPEG and all that crap. Uh, there was an initiative to do that with uh, video content mm -hmm. that would be decoded at the television. And of course, that failed horribly. Mm -hmm. Very similar to what you're just talking about. You know, we had continuous uh, re analysis of, of the content. But when, it, when the cost was figured out to do it, no one wanted to pay the cost. Right. Yeah, um, and the solution, I would argue, was Steve Jobs realizing that if you charge 99 cents for an MP3, people will just buy it rather than pirate it. It was an economic solution, not a technical solution. And so what we're trying to do here is make this so ubiquitous and easy to do that, it's, that it, is, it brings it below the, 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 that threshold. Like it's more of an economic solution that's backed up by technology. But, uh, would you agree with me? Well, I'm not sure. I, mean, I, think, I think it was a use case problem or uh, encrypted to, uh, uh, saying encrypted content to your, your entertainment system requires lots of steps on the part of the user and the manufacturers. Mm -hmm. And no one could actually agree. And the customers didn't really like going through, oh, I have to validate every piece. And so in the end, they wouldn't use it. Right. Um, mostly because to make encryption work, you have to customize it. You have to have, uni you have to have individualized encryption. So I encrypt it one way for you and one way for Kim and one way for Reza and one way for, well, right? It's more authenticating the video content is what it was all about. Yeah. Well, HDCP 1.3 has this. Huh? HDCP, the, the HDMI standard, yeah. does end-to-end -end encryption to the, the Nobody display does. device. Nobody mm. uses it. It's there. It is, it is it's it's in there, but nobody uses it. Yeah, that's possible. Who is our, our uh, chairman or whatever of I, our 
ISO committee. Yeah. Pushed it really hard. Yeah. Nobody uses it today. Yeah, that makes sense. So what I'm going to, what I'm showing you here is something that is, is part of um, existing authentication schemes. So everybody now has accounts with like Sony and Microsoft and all that stuff. So this rides on top of it. And so when you are buying a video game from Microsoft, what you're actually doing is you're buying a proof that you bought the, the video game, not, not necessarily the game itself. They can cache the game. They can put it all out in the edges. They can even push it ahead of time to the Xboxes and then they unlock it by you, you know, you pay and it gives you the, the cryptographic proof that you can then give to the Xbox and say, yeah, I did. You're like, here's my receipt, you know, like here's my ticket to the concert, let me in, right? Um, okay, so I'm, I'm just gonna get to go through these real quick. So smart use of cryptography is important. Um, the, the other thing that uh, differentiates what we have developed and what we're building, um, or what we have built, is uh, that our solution is with the data. Every existing, solution that is in proposal at this point. I don't see, I don't know of anything that's actually in production or even close to in production at this point. But everything I've seen that is proposed is tied to a data silo or a blockchain. So like Adobe is leading um, a content authenticity thing to try to lock you into their creative suite, I think. Um, and it's all about going to be on their servers. So it's like, I can prove I own this because Adobe says I own it. That's, that's their solution. And then there's a bunch of blockchain solutions coming out of the Web3 space where it's like, you own it because you put all of your data on our blockchain. And the blockchain says that you know, your attestation is, is correct and hasn't been moved. I, we think that the correct solution is it needs to be with the data. Um, and so we, did, we designed it that way. Um, the, last, the other two here, late binding trust, this actually is a, an interesting approach to how you do security. Instead of doing upfront authentication, what you do is continuous reauthorization during the use or at transaction time. So instead of um, doing the initial authentication at the beginning and saying, okay, yeah, you're great, and, and let it go, um, like play the video game or whatever, uh, at the time of the transaction and at any point afterwards and repeatedly, you have these, the ability like endpoints to a server that you can check um, that the claims in the provenance are true. So if I put out a provenance log that publishes my name and my date of birth and my mailing address, I can also publish along with that a URL to multiple KYC vendors that are willing to verify that my claims are true. So you can say, hey, this is what I think is true. Is this true? And the businesses that are in the business of knowing what is and isn't true can tell you yes or no. And the security rests on the fact that it's, it might be easy for me to fool one, but it's pretty much impossible for me to fool all of them. And so you as the consumer of the provenance can set a policy that says, hey, I need proof from six KYC vendors, and I need at least two of those to be government organizations. And what we've built allows you to automate all of this. So anyway, and then decentralized, the only point I want to make here is that there's a lot of confusion around the term decentralized versus distributed. Um, my definition is that, is that decentralized is about power, not about computers. Okay, so distributed is about computers. Facebook is millions of computers all over the world. They're distributed. They all work together to, to execute a program called Facebook. But Facebook is not decentralized in the sense that the relationship between the users and Facebook is asymmetric, um, and they have all the power and I don't. So there's no way for me to take all my data out of Facebook, move it over to an alternative, and replace Facebook. They, they own the data. They control everything, right? So Facebook is distributed but not decentralized. Anyway, I'm going to move on. Let's get to something interesting. Um, one of the things during our research that that we came across, and this is related to what we're launching in two weeks, um, is that for functional identity, the minimum unit is a verifiable cryptographic key history. It's not your keys, it's your key history. Um, and, and we know this to be true because in all of the Web3 systems right now, your identity is a public key. And when you rotate your keys or you lose your keys, it breaks the links in the system. Um, this is also true with the Web of Trust and like GPG and signing Git commits and emails and all that stuff. Um, when you rotate your keys, you break the identifier that other people know you as. And so there has to be a secure way to restore that. And um, 
the right answer is actually to abstract away from the keys themselves and refer to your key history. And so this is also a form of provenance, actually. And that's why I brought it up. OK, so provenance logs. They're cryptographically verifiable history of, or, yeah, sorry, I mistyped here, verifiable key history and the associated metadata. So doing late binding trust, the associated metadata are endpoints to KYC vendors and things like that. Um, and by doing your key history, uh, you, you're able to, like other people are able to convince themselves that the, the key that they knew you by uh, is in your key history and then you can get the, the, their latest key. And so there's a secure way to restore uh, the cryptographic references between systems. So we can heavily rely on cryptography now because there is a, a unified way for people to stay up to date on whose keys are what. And because these logs um, can be stored basically anywhere uh, and are resolvable any, you know, in many different ways from DNS or like a distributed hash table or you can put them on a web server and use a web search engine, it doesn't matter. Um, we're now building an infrastructure for key management that uh, is secure end to end and, and, and is asynchronous and does not require both parties to participate to maintain the links between all of us. This is actually quite revolutionary. I'm, I'm droning right now, and this kind of seems like boring, dry stuff, but it's, I'll get to, I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through something here in a minute, and I think you guys all get why it's, it's so important. Um, so let's talk about some current use cases. And I'm trying to make this interesting, but I, I'm like a mega nerd, and so it's really fun for me to talk about the technicals. Uh, I used to work at the Linux Foundation. I've been in open source forever. Uh, one of the problems that we've always faced in open source is um, how do you control who can contribute to your, your open source project? And how do you know that all their contributions are bound by the contributor license agreement, the, the code of conduct, um, all the things, right? All the legal stuff around it. Um, by storing key cryptographic key histories, these provenance logs, inside the Git repos themselves, we can build a full IAM system with just the, just the um, Git repo. So you can delegate management to the maintainers so they can rotate your keys. You can do a social recovery. So like if I lose my keys, I can go to the maintainers of the project and they can do a threshold signature on an event that rotates my keys and they can effectively restore my account. Okay. Does that make sense? Is everybody following how this works? So this is GitHub without GitHub. This is fully decentralized and it just goes with the repo itself. And what's really interesting is now you can build a regime around a Git repo that demands that every contribution be signed by a key that is the most recent key of one of the key histories in the repo itself. So when you join a project, the first thing you do is build a key history file, a provenance log, and you submit it. And inside that provenance log, you're going to have to have a digital signature over the contributor licensing agreement, over the code of conduct, because you're agreeing through the, your digital signatures that you're going to follow all these rules and you agree with the legal framework. And so then only after that you've done that can you submit a patch that's signed by your key so that it will be accepted. And what's interesting here is like how many of you guys, how many of you are actually developers? Have you ever written any code and submitted code? Okay. Have you digitally signed your commits? No. Why? It's exactly right. It's a pain in the ass, right? There is no central place to put your key that everybody can find it. If you download a repo that has digitally signed commits in it, you don't have any of the keys to verify them. They don't come with the repo. But we do all these Git clones, right? But we do Git clone everywhere. We have all these different versions, and then we merge them back. Mm -hmm. We've been through that a few, few times, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And it would be great if we had then validation of that because as you know, the latest way of it, cyber attacks is by changing the contributors. Yep. In a structured like CI CD like structure, like build on AWS, it has all this stuff built into it. So you are certified and submitting certified uh, changes, and only the, so the, cert, the only certain certificates have access to the repos. In the continuous, uh, in, yeah, the continuous building system, that's just to protect Amazon from you saying that Amazon built something that has a backdoor in it. They're just saying like, hey, we, we just did what you told us to do, and we can prove it. Again, they have a whole system that says, so the only thing that, that actually built it was this thing, and it accessed it over this TLS connection, and, and you have certificates and everything like that, right? So. Um, but again, that doesn't fix the bigger problem, 
which is in an open source world where you have a lot of contributions from everywhere, you need to make sure everybody is agreeing to the legal thing. And you need to make sure that, you know, all of the contents in the repo itself are not modified later, as you were saying, and which means they all need to be digitally signed. But now we, we have no meaningful digital signature regime in place. And what we built, and actually one of the things we're working on with um, uh, one of our projects, our pilot projects, is, is demoing this, actually, um, and showing that this is actually the realization of what is it, the executive order 170, oh, blah, 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 whatever it is, you know, out of the White House. Like, we need to know where all the open source comes from, guys. You know, like, that's, that's what they're basically demanding. This is really, really very powerful because if you're a large corporation, you're all using a standardized check in system and you've identified everybody and, and you, you have all the proof of who did it right there. However, as soon as the, as the corporation gets too big, some of the popular packages that do that are easily hacked. Uh, you lose all that data. So if we could do that with Git, that would be really, that's a really kind of a cool thing. Not just because of, of uh, the source data we use for AI or something, but because we need to track our code. Yeah, it's exactly right. And, and the thing I'll point out, you said corporations, but the world, and the current estimate is that something like 91 or 90 to 95 percent of the software that runs literally everything is open source software, which means that none of it is digitally signed. None of it, because none of the open source is digitally signed. Yeah. So if you if you have a company, you wrote a bunch of software, and you're going to sell it to the government. Chances are you're going to get less than 10 percent of what you think you're going to get, more like 2 percent, because the government will actually examine all of your code to find out if it's anywhere else in the open source repository. Yeah, that's exactly right. And that's where that whole S bomb stuff from the other from the keynote was about. Because the government does this. They're like and in fact I just the other day did for a friend of mine. He was like, hey, I, I've got this customer, they need to know uh, all the dependencies for our software. Um, and that they're all properly licensed, and then how much of our product is made up of all of these, these um, dependencies. And because of what we were doing here for this project, I was like in an afternoon, not even really, I, I wrote about 30 minutes worth of code just to like to orchestrate the whole process, run this project, run this, co this command, then this command, then this command. And I was able to do a full audit um, like in an hour for them. And AI tool. Hmm? If you're using an AI tool, who owns that open source code that went into that AI, train that AI tool? Yeah, this is a good question. <laughs> this is a really good question. I, I wasn't using an AI tool. I was using our software, but yeah. Yeah, because it, it's a real serious problem. I've written uh, policies for corporation, large corporations, mm -hmm. and the open source uh, license is so fantastic because any tiny one line of code is sufficient to contaminate a program. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, it's, uh... Missing semicolon is a security bug. Oh, my, my word. I, I worked on Firefox security team for <laughs> five years, and I was never not surprised. <laughs> Let's just say it that way. Like, I, my mornings would more normally start off where I would read some of the incident reports, and our stand-up that morning was like, now how the hell did they do that? that? That's how it always started. Every one of these things is like, what the hell was that? How, how does that work? Yeah, I could tell you some stories that'll turn your hair white. Um, that's probably why I'm like this. It's just like, holy crap. At one point, I was so despondent about the lack of actual security that I thought I was in the wrong industry. I was like, there is absolutely no way to make software that's secure. And then Rust came along, and I was like, actually, maybe we can. Well, in aeronautics, I was at Garrett, probably when you were in Boeing. Yeah. And uh, we had really strict rules. We had used PLM. We had a, a whole different attitude about software development than they have today. This is a serious problem today. So this is, brings more need for what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I'll just cover this real quick. I'm going to be in Brussels in July 
And I'm launching a, uh, we, we are, Cryptid is launching, this is sort of us giving back to the open source community, um, a tool, a new tool called BetterSign, uh, which replaces GPG. Um, it works like Keybase. It's a fully decentralized Keybase, though. You don't have to pay for anything. Um, it allows you to build these provenance logs to assert your identity and publish them. Uh, it, it currently, it uses IPFS, but it can use a, a website or anything like that. You can put them anywhere. It's not bound to any data silo. By putting them in IPFS and uh, using the global DHT in IPFS, we're, we're basically a fly on the back of the 900-pound gorilla, right? So we're leveraging existing infrastructure that will always be there. I mean, Google, uh, Cloudflare, they all run IPFS nodes. They all run IPFS DHTs and all this stuff. So you create a, a, a a provenance log, you can have as many as you want, by the way. I use them uh, to track my relationships with different organizations. So I have one for every repo that I'm available, you know, like interacting on. Um, I have one for every service that I talk to, that kind of stuff, yeah? Why do you call it a provenance log instead of a ledger? Um, because a ledger implies some distributed consensus. It could be a ledger. I guess I just didn't want to call it something that everybody would think is a blockchain. It's not a blockchain. It's not. Um, <laughs> this is a really good idea, uh, a really good question. It actually is a blockchain <laughs> because it is a ha because it is a hash linked data structure. Hold on, hold on. It, it depends on your definition of a blockchain. If a blockchain to you is a distributed consensus network that's verifying blocks being put into a hash linked data structure, then it is not a blockchain because there is no distributed consensus component to it. Okay. But the underlying data structure itself is a hash link data structure where each subsequent entry in the log stores the hash of the previous one so that the entire log is contained in this, this hash that you know, contains all the previous ones. And then it works very similarly to a blockchain because it uses cryptographic um, scripts, if you will, like if you understand how blockchains, well, how Bitcoin works where there's like a lock and an unlock script. Uh, the current event, the current most recent event in the log has a script in it that says the next event has to meet the criteria in this script. And that script does things like check a digital signature, um, check to make sure that they haven't changed any of these fields, right? So you can do delegation, you can do um, full enterprise policy management because it's programmable. These are scripts. So you can say, like, I can allow you to change the value associated with this key, this configuration value or whatever, um, if it's signed by your key. But you can't actually change anything else. The next entry in the log would be invalid if you, even though you'd signed it with your key, and I'm saying, yeah, I'll recognize events signed by your key, but only if you change this one thing. So if you're, let's say you're the, the person who manages the, um, the publishing of time series data in a graph, right? And occasionally you move from one server to another because the server dies or you, know, you go to a load balancing cluster and you have to update the URL in which the data gets pushed to, okay? We can have a provenance log that tracks the, co the configuration data of, your, of the whole service and the piece where the data gets pushed to the server to be put in a graph that everybody can see, that's managed by you. I can delegate to you the ability to change that URL, but nothing else. So you can add an entry to that configuration log, that provenance log over the configuration data, so long as it's signed by your key, which I've delegated to you, and you're only changing the thing that I've delegated the ability to change to you. So this, how, this is how you can do full IAM. In enterprise systems, yes, in a, it's AI, AI, IAM and it's also policy management and enforcement. In a ledger. In a ledger, which is a, just a file that can be put anywhere and anybody can verify it. So you're not locked into a, into a silo. Uh, With singular control instead of group consensus. Well, y yeah, the, the, anybody can verify. Hold on a second here. It, it is. It is, but you don't have a distributed consensus. Okay, so there's no network involved here. This is something where if you can create a uh, proof that you meet the criteria of the lock scripts, then the event that you're proposing to add to the log gets valid, is validated and is there. Now, um, that doesn't mean you can't 
publish a bunch of false log entries, but anybody looking at the log will just quickly see that, well, that one's not valid, this one's not valid, that one's not valid. And so they're able to verify what is and isn't valid at the point of consumption of these provenance logs, which can be anywhere doing anything. Does that make sense? So like the security is that you can't provide sufficient proof to make your like messed with log entry be accepted by anybody. Does it have heuristic analysis to keep it from being flooded by something or like nope. anything? That, so someone could post like three a second for yep. a while. Right. So um, these are files though. So you would have to append to the file and then re-upload it somewhere else and then claim that that's valid. But anybody would easily see that like, well, your proof is not valid. And by the way, how would you redirect anybody to your copy? So what we've built, so I, okay, so it, what's important here is that the, 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 with the data piece is, is what we're talking about here. Like there's no, necess, there's no arbiter of truth. There's like no one server that you're sending messages to. These are files that are on your disk. These are files that are on a server. These are files that are somewhere where people can get to them. So um, this, what, I'm, what we're launching here, this global PKI system, is a network of peer-to-peer -peer servers that run a global distributed hash table. And what, ma what they do is they take the VLAD, which is the, the new non-key material ID, they're, they're called very long-lived addresses, VLADs, um, that point to these provenance logs, okay? And what you're doing is you're taking a VLAD or an old public key and you're getting the content address in IPFS of the provenance log itself, okay? okay. Now, to get those distributed hash tables to redirect people to a new content address, like your appended log, like the one you tried to get everybody to do, or to, to look at, like you're trying to spam them with, um, those distributed hash table peers, they actually validate every one of them because they have the whole provenance log. And so they know what the rules are for accepting the next log entry. And so if you don't give it one that is valid, it just ignores it and it won't update the, the, the pointer in the distributed hash table. So you're not able to like spam it in any meaningful way and you're not able to get the rest of us who are looking up that provenance log to go anywhere except the correct one. So the distributed hash table is like a distributed consensus? Nope. It's different. They're not doing a, any proof of work or anything like that. All they're doing is they're just validators. They're just like, is this next event valid? And if it is, they're like, yep, okay, that adds it, and then we'll update our pointer, and then they gossip the update to all of the other um, peers in the distributed hash table. Like, hey, we found a valid addition to this provenance log, here you go, and, and they just gossip amongst themselves. What industries do you see uh, best succeeding with your product? or? having the greatest benefit and gain using okay. the product? The first question, which one will succeed in using the product? All of them, literally all of them. This is data integrity, and every industry is data intensive these days. So um, which ones will have the most success out of the gate? Uh, I actually think that the first big users are going to be uh, developers. And that's why we went, why we're launching this PKI system, because when you install better sign, it's a drop-in replacement for GPG, so now you can start doing this on all your Git repos. Yeah, yeah I, Cam. I would just add, Dave, that we, we see developers um, specifically doing uh, data engineering for uh, AI, as AI is really driving sort of market right. pressure, and, uh, and the responsibilities that developers are going to have, you know, uh, as an outcome of the, the uh, Scarlett Johansson concerns and um, uh, you know other things, especially with what uh, you know Apple's come out with. Um, the the market pressure is going to demand that the AI engineers really take a good look at provenance and uh, how to establish that within their workflow. Right. So, as a company, our main goal is to turn data engineers into provenance engineers. So yeah, you are working on managing data and processing data and generating value from the data, but um, we're going, we provide the tools and we're going to train you on how to do provenance engineering so that everything you do with data is defensible uh, legally and also defensible from a security standpoint because you, always, you will always know what data you have, where did it come from, has it been modified, right? And do you have the rights to have it? 
Yeah, and I, I was just going to add, and it will add uh, transparency and verifiable authenticity um, to you know deliver value to the end user customers. So that when you know this gets into consumer applications, when they're looking at things that are generated by AI, they can actually have confidence in it's not something that's um, you know, going to get them in trouble or you know, hurt them in any kind of way. But mitigating both uh, liability risk and uh, potential harm. Yeah. So, and then the last use case, that's why I switched to this, is what Cam's talking about, is, uh, is providing an end-to-end -end intellectual property regime um, for uh, defensible AI training, right? So, every, I mean, if you're not training an AI model right now, I don't know what planet you're, on, you're from because everybody's training an AI model. And I think what we're going to find real soon is that most of the AI models that are being built today are going to run into... So, one of two possibilities is going to happen. One, they're going to start running into serious legal trouble because they trained it on the internet and they didn't own the internet. Um, or more likely, there's going to be a lot of money spent on lobbyists and there's going to be some new regulatory regime that's, become, that's put into place. But the, the models that have been trained prior to that will be somewhat grandfathered in, right? There, there's a likelihood that, you know, I've heard ideas of, hey, we're just going to tax the, these AI companies um, because they train their AIs on all of our data. So I don't know what they're going to do with the tax money, but the idea is that they're just going to, it's kind of like when CD burners came out and Canada was like, well, we're going to tax them to try to mitigate the impact, the, the economic impact on recording artists, right? I mean, it's Canada. That's an interesting idea. I, I don't know if it worked. It would be interesting. But uh, anyway, what we're doing is we're skating towards where the puck's going to be, which is if you're a company, you don't want to take risk of building, you know, heavily investing in an AI thing only to be rug pulled by regulatory or legal action. Oh, yeah. <laughs> nice. I got 12 minutes left. Or is that over? That's it. That's That's it? it. <laughs> All right, bye. See you later. No, no more questions. Um, Thank you guys for listening. You guys are great. It was awesome questions. Um, we're uh, crypto technologies has been around for four years. We've been doing a ton of research in this space. Um, as you heard me ramble on at the beginning, I've been doing this for a very, very long time. And this is, I thought at this point in my career, I would be getting bored. But this is actually the most exciting part of my career because we finally have solved some of the problems that have been plaguing me for literally ever. So anyway, thank you, everybody. This is my Telegram, and this one's Cam's LinkedIn. So if you guys want to uh, get in touch with us, we, we have um, some initial uh, charter customers coming on board, and we're looking for more. So if you want to like kick the tires, figure out how we can help you with your data integrity and stuff like that, reach out to Cam or find me on Telegram. And, and happily, I would love to sit down and have a conversation. So yeah, thanks guys. Thank you. Thank you, Reza.